some people are born great, and some people have greatness thrust upon them. But it's a third group, which is people achieve greatness. And I'm here to introduce tonight somebody, somebody who gets up at 4.30 every morning, 365 days a year, in order to write before she has to turn to her regular job of being a full professor and associate chair at the English department. So this is a person, I say, who hasn't had a trust upon her, but who has achieved whatever greatness she's been able to achieve. Uh, and not only is she doing that today, she wrote her first short story when she was five or six years old. It was called Christmas with the Stumbles. And it was about a family that kept stumbling around and knocking each other over. Uh, this year, she's come out with a book that involves a little girl who's discovered in a rocket ship amusement park uh, near Cape Canaveral. Uh, she's in trauma. Her mother is lying dead at her side. She suppresses that memory completely and gets adopted by a couple who try to look into her real background so they can tell her the truth about who she is and where she comes from. But the man who's been doing that research, her adoptive father, dies before he can tell her anything about what he knows. So I want to submit that she's still writing about families 25, 30 years later who are stumbling around and knocking each other over. So without any further ado, Stephanie Smith. Thanks, John. Yes, I did write that story when I was <clears throat> very little. I also illustrated it. <laughs> but I wrote it for my mother, and I would like to dedicate tonight to my mother. Um, she was a librarian, and so I'm very happy to help out with the library whenever I can. My sister is also a librarian, so libraries are in the family. So tonight, I would first like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, both on behalf of myself and on behalf of Library West. And with special thanks to um, Professor Isabel Silver for putting this together, the lady in pink. Um, so I would like to start by saying a few words about the War Paint Trilogy, because the novel that John was describing, Baby Rocket, which is this one, came out uh, in June. But it is part of a three book series. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the series. And then I'm going to read a little bit from Baby Rocket. Um, and then um, uh, I will pause and I will be happy to ask and answer questions or talk further. Um, I've brought books with me to sell to you. And I'm happy to sign them. And I can tell you how to get the books if you don't want to drag one home with you today. Um, and I'm happy to send you a book if you'd like. So whichever way, if you get interested. So, <clears throat> the War Paint Trilogy is being published by Thames River Press in London. Um, all three of the novels deal with contemporary American women who are struggling to balance work, love, illness, and trauma and, as John said, tangled family histories. War Paint, which is the first of the trilogy, so that's that one, was published in October of 2012. And this one tells the story of the relationship between three women painters who are coming to terms with their mortality and artistic frustrations. If any of you are artists, you know that artistic frustration is mostly what you have. So, <clears throat> Baby Rocket then follows an, hist an historian who, as John said, discovers a shattering family secret about herself, after which she must build a new sense of who she is and sort of become a detective of her own life to figure out what happened. And finally, the third novel, which will be published next year, um, they are giving me a pub date of February 1st, is titled Content Burns. And it's about two women with this, the same Puritan name, Content Burns. They're in the same family, but they're separated by three centuries. Um, and the, 
The trauma of the story is the first content Burns, who takes that Puritan name, survives the massacre of the Pequot tribe in 1637. The second content Burns survives 9-11. So these two stories run parallel, on parallel tracks. So they're both about women who survive this historical trauma, and then what do you do? How do you get over that? So the three novels form a trilogy through the bonds of family and friendship between the characters. So for example, the main character of Baby Rocket, whose name is Clementine Dance, um, is the second cousin to the main character in Content Burns. So they're connected that way. So once you start the series, you start getting implicated into the family, family relations. Um, as well, each novel offers a kind of commentary on female figures taken from folklore or fairy tales. So in War Paint, the figure is the witch. In Baby Rocket, the figure is the imprisoned princess. And in Content Burns, the figure is the changeling. So that those figures run through and within the stories as you go forward. But each of them also required a fair amount of historical research. So when I describe an event, or a geography, or even an historical object, you can be sure that the description is as real as I can make it. Can everybody hear me? So in other words, I try to strike a balance between fantasy and reality, since life is so often a strange and compelling mixture of both. Children, I think, live with and in this mixture more intensely than adults often allow themselves to. So one of my goals is to heighten the intensity of the exchange between reality and fantasy for my adult readers. Baby Rocket was inspired by the exchange between reality and fantasy, since a good part of it depends on the history of the space race, as it played out on Cape Canaveral. And that was a time, of course, when the whole nation forced, literally forced, an age-old fantasy traveling to the moon into reality. So now, I'd like to read a brief section from Baby Rocket, which I hope you will find intriguing. I was startled recently when a reader <clears throat> came up to me and said, you know, I normally I don't read very much, but you couldn't put your novel down. So that's always exciting to hear that. She said, I stayed up all night to finish it. It was your fault. So I took that as an encouraging sign. Um, and if you happen to look at reader reviews on Amazon, you will see that I, I have a little fan following, which is nice. And I, I uh, hope that you will become fans. OK, so there's a few little things you need to know about the story, and then I'll read. Um, I'm not going to keep you here forever, so, um, uh, but I, I want to give you a little taste of Baby Rocket. The title of the novel refers to the character I mentioned, Clementine Dance, whose nickname is Lem. Her nickname is also within the family Sweet Pea. In 1966, she was found by police a few yards from her dead mother. She was hiding in a kitty grocery store rocket ride, hiding down. Um, she was traumatized. She wouldn't speak. So the police dubbed her Baby Rocket for where they found her. As an adult, Lem has no memory of this event. Uh, when her adoptive father dies of a heart attack, she discovers not only was she abandoned that way, but this man who she knew as her biological father was, in fact, her adoptive father. That he married her mother um, when she was a child. Now, without either parent alive, she must try to piece together this past. Why was she abandoned? Why did her mother die? How did she die? Who is her biological father? And this journey will take her from California, where her father dies, to New York, where she lives, to Florida, where her mother died, and then finally out to Martha's Vineyard, where she will start to put the pieces together and to heal her life. So the scene I'm going to read is set on the Space Coast for us Floridians. Um, the year is 1999, so a few years ago. And Lem has discovered that her late mother actually had a twin sister who is still living. So she has come to meet family members she doesn't know she had and doesn't remember. Oh, and I guess one other thing. I did say her familial nickname is Sweet Pea, by which I mean the family who raised her. So I think that's all you need to know. And if, but if you have questions, like if I haven't filled in enough background when I'm done, please ask. Um, and I'm going to try and read with this microphone since 
um, the door is loud. <laughs> so, um, but bear with me because it's going to be a little hard. Um, Okay, um, this is from a chapter called Gemini, and it's from the section of the book called The Space Coast. So I chose this for us since we live close. Okay. Um, I stepped out of the car. My friend Leah shifted to back up, and I wished to God she wouldn't leave me. A shape, indistinct, approached the broken screen door of the house. The mesh shielded the bright silhouette. I had not taken off my sunglasses, so the dimness of the threshold was doubled. The sunlight remained fierce. I sweated. The shape, a woman's shape, wrung her hands, and I was tempted to run since I could still see Leah's Volvo making a plume of dust on its way up to the main road. And then the screen door scraped open, and a tall man stepped out. He sported a long mustache and wore gold rim aviator glasses in a style so out of date that it was back in style. Hello, he said in a mild twang that could have been Texas rather than Florida. There was something else, a lisp? I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. You must be Clementine. Alan, I said, holding out my hand. His smile framed his eyes and folds. Al, come in. It won't do having you standing out here like a solicitor. And so I stepped into a house that had once been briefly my own, even if I had no memory of it. The entryway was narrow. Suddenly, I knew Alan would. I mean, he must, in order to let me pass, step back and to his left into the kitchen, which, unlike the hall, was bright yellow with white trim. There was no air conditioning, and I sweated right through my cotton sleeves. The perfume I'd put on that morning gave a last defiant tang before body odor took over. <laughs> Al, dressed in blue jeans and a neat pressed shirt with snap buttons, looked cool. He brushed the hair falling over his forehead to one side and asked if the place had been hard to find. Yes, I admit it, but as you see, I'm here. I keep telling Mother she ought to move into town, he said as he leaned back against the sink, but she doesn't like to give up on the old place. I looked around. The kitchen was generous and pleasant, with glass front cupboards and scrubbed wooden countertops. A jam jar of black-eyed Susan sat on the sill, a plate of brownies near the icebox. We're so glad you could come, ma'am, said Al. Again, I noticed a slurring lisp. Do you mind dogs? No, I said, I have a poodle. He unfolded his height and reached across the room to open a back door. A silent mutt padded across the room, his nail pit pitting on the formica as he made his way along sniffing. He looked up at me with dog eyes that seemed infinitely sad, as if the poor thing had been watching the banality of evil work in an indecent parlor in the backyard. This here's Sputnik, said Al. We call him Spuds, right, boy? The dog's curve of a tail started wagging. Spuds is older than any mutt has a right to be, so he does take a whiz on the floor now and then. You can't help it, eh, can you, buddy? Alan placed his hand on the dog's head, and Spuds sank down to roll gently over to have his belly rub. Sputnik was the last of Liberty's pups, said my cousin, as he gave me a searching glance from behind his glasses. Lip was the best. Granddaddy found her a few hours after she'd been whelped. She'd been near to drown with a big old rock trout around her neck, so we figured her for the runt. But she did fix up nice, and she was the best Christmas present I ever got. He smiled again. I judged him to be about six feet six inches. Clearly, whatever gene pool we shared, he'd gotten those inches elsewhere. You don't remember, Lip, do you, ma'am? He asked. Startled, I said, should I? He shrugged. Maybe. Oh. I glanced around again. I had no tangible memory, just a vague familiarity that kept, that left at me without warning in the mind. Do you, I asked, remember me? Why, yes, ma'am, he said. As I told you, we lived here together for a brief spell in 66. You were about four and I was about six, so I do recall. I heard him, but nothing he said formed a picture for me. I saw nothing, just a blank wall of anxiety. I bent down to pet the sleeping dog in order to avert my face. I just don't remember, I mumbled. Excuse me, ma'am? I said, I don't remember. Sorry? I looked up, a bit irritated. I said, and then I stopped. I knew why Alan lisped. He was deaf. He'd been reading my lips until I had turned my face away. I saw then that he was wearing hearing aids in both ears. Oddly, the fact of his deafness stirred something. I wouldn't have called
called it a memory, more like a distant cry. Oh, Alan, I said, apologetic, I'd forgotten. No matter, hate these things. He touched the hearing aid with the tip of his finger. But the help. I'm sorry, I said, wondering how I could have forgotten something I had also never known. It made me dizzy. Do you mind? Could I sit down? I asked. Excuse my manners, he said, and led me across the hall into, the, into a parlor. Neither large nor small. It was a degree or two cooler than the kitchen and furnished with a floral print couch, two easy chairs, and a low coffee table. But there was a cluster of photographs on one wall and no television, but rather a console radio that must have been a collector's item. The parlor opened into, onto the screen porch I had seen from the road. I sat in an easy chair with the back of my shirt stuck on my skin. I searched for something to say as Alan looked at me, expectant. But thanks was all I could muster. Would you like some iced tea, ma'am? Oh, yes, I said with a re je relief, just the sight of death break. That would be lovely. Yes, thank you. He disappeared, replaced by Sputnik, who heaped, him, heaped himself up onto the couch. I wished I had a handkerchief. I wanted to splash my face with ice water. Automatically, I got up and headed for the bathroom. That stopped me like a bullet. How the heck did I know where the bathroom was? Suspended then in the hall before the bathroom door, I hovered, half aware of the now, it half inside my own head, searching for something like a light switch, like a person left in a dark house. I leaned against the door and closed my eyes. There suddenly came a faint scent, light, pungency on the air. It sent a wave of pure fear right through me, and I knew that when I opened my eyes, she would be standing at the end of the hall behind the door of the bedroom. Her perfume began to gag me. My face flushed, my hands already damp and slick. I opened my eyes. My aunt did not smile. She regarded me. Her eyes, as I remembered them in that first moment, seemed remarkable for their almond shape and arresting color, the color of harebells, a deeper, warmer blue than my father's or mine. Her face was plump and triangular, and her wide, pale forehead was one I knew well from trying to have my own hair cut to deal with it. Her cheeks tapered down to a round chin, and she was wearing her frizzy, faded blonde hair tucked back behind her ears. That slight untidiness, along with her forehead and deep-lidded eyes, made her seem far younger than she was. When she spoke, her voice was modest, as if she was afraid of her own sound. What she said, however, when she did speak, and kneeled me to the floor like an electrocution. I'm not kidding. She said, sweet pea, and for a second, it felt as if her voice had flipped some fatal internal heat sweep, which, sweet pea? My name, right? Just my nickname. But I hadn't expected it, not in this house, and not on her lips. Thank you. So, I could read more, I can read you a little piece of war paint, or I could take questions. So it's up to you. But what? Read more. Read more? Yes? A little bit more? Okay, thank you. All right, so, war paint. Um, I'm going to read you a little section of war paint. The section I'm going to read is historical, to give you a sense of some of the way in which the book looks back onto the past. I'm actually reading this little section for my student, Nacha, who's here. Um, uh, and I, uh, I'm reading it for her because it takes place in Paris. Okay, so uh, I don't think you need to know anything, though I'm happy to take questions about this section. Nancy Jones Davis stood in the lobby of the Paris Ritz, waiting for her new husband. He was asking, in halting French, what might be the easiest way to get to a bookstore his wife wanted to visit. Barely 20 years old, married a week. She'd already begun to take the measure of her husband, only to find his sleeves, as it were, a bit short, and his trousers a bit too long. Her infatuation with the young doctor had began to mellow out into infection. She stood nervous and a bit impatient. Her French, learned first in boarding school and then at Smith College, was better than his. And besides, she knew exactly where the Rue de Lorient, my French is not good, was she didn't need directions, but he did have to ask. She tugged at a glove, touched her hat, and settled her clutch a little more firmly under her arm. Tom headed across the rich red carpet to her. 
With his needle nose and already thinning, thinning hair, he wasn't a beauty, but he was funny. And such a dedicated doctor. Her heart made a little splurge of, he's mine. <laughs> Darling, he said, slipping a hand to her elbow. Are you sure you want to go to this bookstore? I think it must be a tad disreputable. She laughed. Of course it is. Every artist I know talks about it. Rude to the Lodium. Is that in a poor neighborhood? Come on, Tom. Paul would be mortified if we don't go. Do you want a cab? No, let's walk. I thought it sounded rather far, he said, glancing behind him. Oh, Tom, said Nancy merrily, nothing is ever that far in Paris. He smiled in a way his bride had come to understand as both apologetic and annoyed, and followed her lead. Cold and clear, the flat, unruffled, unruffled cerulean sky arched over the Seine as they crossed it, two young Americans between the wars, burnished by the armor of a yet untarnished love. They said little. The light was too perfect, the city too various, all of it new to Tom, all of it beloved by Nancy. While he took note of streets Parisian, she drank in the comfort of sunflowers or daisies sold in dull silver pots, ivy and architecture, the winter's sharp metal air. She wore a cloche she bought yesterday, one with a small brim, and a fur trim coat from Revion C. Vian Rue de Petit Champ, bought with her mother's money and at her mother's insistence, the, the extravagance made Tom wince. When Nancy caught a glimpse of herself in the bookshop's plate window, she felt, well, quite modern. Is this it? asked Tom, squinting through the glass. There's the bard, she said, pointing to a portrait of Shakespeare hanging above their heads on an iron rod. Right. Yeah, this is it. What did Paul tell you about this place? If you are an American artist, you must visit. But we're not artists. Oh, bother. You read, don't you? This is a bookstore, isn't it? And she stepped up into the shop. Tom doffed his hat and followed. Once inside, he relaxed. He was, after all, a reader. And the shop was crammed floor to ceiling with books. Several walls hosted black and white framed portraits of men and women, only two of whom Tom knew. But you, you were living in or around New York, as Tom and Nancy were. It would have been hard not to know the Fitzgeralds. The papers followed the couple as they tore around town. Two women were standing beside the marble fireplace, underneath about a dozen or so framed portraits. One wore a neat tweed jacket and skirt set with a round white collar and a soft striped silk bow tie. Her thickly curled brownish hair bobbed to the earlobe. The other, younger woman, also in a short dark bob, wore a green drop waist dress and leaned against the top of the hearth, writing something on a small white card. Both women had strong features, the kind of handsome rather than pretty. There, said the younger woman. Now I'm one of the company, too. I'm glad, said her companion, said, taking the card. Is there anything else you'd like to take today? The woman shook her head just as a man stepped in from the street, or rather, blew in at a clip that was almost a dash. Nancy worried about the possibility of books flying off shelves as he whisked by the laden tables to claim the younger woman by slipping an arm around her green drop waist. The older woman said something low, which made the big man laugh, and in another moment, the couple left. A rough, Nancy decided, and went back to her browsing. When she heard the woman in the bow tie sigh and say, poor Bombi, she felt confirmed in her opinion of the one-man windstorm. Who was that? asked Tom suddenly at Nancy's side. How should I know? Well, he looked familiar. All Americans look familiar. Oh, and how do you know the man was an American? He looked American. Tom laughed, and Nancy smiled. Well, he did, she said, putting the book she'd been looking over back on the shelf. Big galoot like that? Want to bet on it? Why? We both thought he was an American. Hmm, said Tom, rubbing his earlobe. True, but I'm going to ask. I want to know. And he stepped over to the woman in the bow tie who was filing library cards. Excuse me, ma'am. The woman looked up. Yes, may I help you find something? No, thank you, but I do have a question. If I may ask, was that man who just left an American? Which made Sylvia Beach, Beach laugh outright. Why, yes, she said. Oh, yes. I don't think there's anyone so American as him. Would you like to see some of his work? These short stories are his, and she reached for a small pile of books on a table, a small pile of In Our Times by Ernest Hemingway. Never heard of him, said Tom, looking over the slim volume. You will, said Sylvia Beach. Trust me, you will. So, for any Hemingway fans in the audience, I, I put him in there. Anyway, 
I'm happy to answer questions or. Well, <clears throat> all three books had separate inspirations, and then after I sort of finished them, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, they're connected. So I went back and made those connections more distinct. So let me, let me give you uh, a quick answer to Baby Rocket, and then if you want to hear more, I'm happy to do that. So this is, this is a strange story. This is where Baby Rocket came from. When my niece was a little girl, she, um, she had a stepbrother born, and his mother, my ex-sister-in-law, liked to rock him in a rocking chair. And my little niece said, oh, he's Baby Rocket, meaning rock. But I heard Baby Rocket, and I thought, that's a great title. Um, and then I just worked the story out from there. Um, uh, the, and that's how sometimes a book comes, war paint. It's a little different. The title came later, um, and really what I was interested in thinking about was how difficult it, is, it really still is to be an American woman painter. When I ask people, so, how many American women painters do you know? I get Georgia O'Keeffe, Georgia O'Keeffe, <laughs> Georgia O'Keeffe. Um, are there any others? And there are many, many others artists, painters, sculptors, but they're not, we don't celebrate them we, the way we celebrate men. So I wanted to write about that, because I paint. And I know lots of women artists. And it get irritated me. Um, so, sometimes it's irritation. The third book was inspired both by a student of mine and by my family. My family um, genealogy goes back to 1637. Well, actually, 1626. The Averys were in Connecticut in 1626. And um, I actually have a giant 800-page volume of family genealogy that the family has privately printed so you can trace the family back. It's big. But in it, it has all these little stories about family. So I wanted to write about that family history. Um, and I had a student who was a poet whose name was Charity Burns. And I thought, oh, there you how, why, how would you, why would you saddle a child with the name Charity Burns? You know? so, so then I thought, well, that, but I don't want to steal her name. But so I chose one that would be even more awful. What if your parents named you Content? <laughs> Content Burns, because that family name had been in the family for so long. So my, my contemporary character, who saw, survives 9-11, actually calls herself Cabby, because her name is Content Abigail Burns, two names you can't stand, and then the Burns part, so, <laughs> um, so that's, that, that's where that one came from. Um, so there are actually pieces of that novel that I have taken directly out of my family history um, and, and fictionalized. So that, that's sort of where they came from. But like, where every book it's different. So, I, I don't know, sometimes something just strikes me. Anybody else? Yeah, but, oh. but the story of a, a young child being left abandoned alongside a dead mother and having to trace her where did that come from? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, no. Um, the I will say that um, you know I, I was fascinated by stories of kids who had to bear monikers like that. You see them in the newspaper because you know some child's been abandoned or run away from home and they they don't can't and so they've given these weird names to locate where they were found. Um, and I figured a baby you know a rocket ride on Cape Canaveral was pretty much a shoe in for the time. Um, but really, after that, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I get inspired by um, history a lot. And so, as you can see, the cover of Baby Rocket has Marilyn Monroe on it. Although people have said to me, that looks like, is that Marilyn, 
That's what it looks like. Man. Yes, yes, it is in fact. Uh-huh. Because um, this is sort of goes to answer the question a little bit. Monroe herself was pretty much an abandoned child, um, and had a very you know sad upbringing in orphanages and stories of abuse. So, I, but what became disturbing to me is that this is not an unusual story. There are a lot of abandoned kids. So I wanted to write a story about one who survives and pretty much recovers, you know? Because um, you hear these stories and then you never hear the end. Or you hear the tragic end of suicide that, that Monroe came to. And so my character at the end of the book says something like, I'm not good at quoting myself, but she says something like, if you tell Marilyn Monroe's story this way, it's the same story of my mother's life. A, 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 a lonely, abandoned child grows up with dreams of, of greatness, only to have those dreams shattered. Well, that was my mother's story, too. So, that's sort of, I don't know, there are a lot of shattered stories from the 1950s. Um, so that's sort of where it came from, too. Um, and I, I take inspiration from my classes. I often taught a class called Women and the Space Race. Um, so, um, so my historian in this book, Lem, is writing a, a history of the Mercury um, Seven, the seven women astronauts who were actually trained to go on the on the Mercury missions, and um, President Johnson basically squashed the program after they had been trained. So they were all ready to go. They were like going, putting their feet, they had their spacesuits on, they were marching out with their, and just killed it because he thought it was too communist. So the first woman in space was, in fact, a communist. <laughs> because we, we dragged our feet until when? Does anybody know when the first woman went into space, American woman? 80s. 80s. Sally Ride. Yep. So it took 20 years before the first American woman is. My, my historian's a little irritated by this fact. She has to keep rewriting her book because the anger keeps coming into the book. And she's like, no, no, erase that. So, yeah. I remember when you were writing or working on this baby rocket and you were doing. No. <laughs> it disappeared. Um, yeah, sometimes sometimes I do that historical research because I think it's gonna, you know, be important, like in the sense of um, what's sitting on someone's dresser. You know, because I really do want to make sure that I don't do something historically inaccurate, but it didn't end up being useful. Um, I did go to Cape Canaveral, and I did, um, you know, make sure that all the places I mentioned, like the Heaven Sent Cafe, were there, um, and, uh, and and stuff like that. I mean, the perfume that I mentioned in the piece that I just read is a, a perfume from the time. Um, uh, you know, it still exists, no, uh, Chanel No. 5, but it was very important in those years, and it's it's the perfume that Monroe wore, so. So there's stuff like that in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, after you had written all these, like, the entire book, how did you go about this book? How do you have the courage to take it out there knowing that it's a possibility of rejection? It's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, you have to, um, you have to don a certain amount of invisible body on because you will get rejections, especially in today's world. Um, so, um, you know, I'll say the same thing that the, um, that the swimmer said. You just don't give up. You just don't give up. Um, you know, the, I forget her name, but the woman who just swam from Cuba. Yeah. You just, you, I had my first novel published when I was 22. And I, I was very, very lucky. I was working with a, a, a writer who was my mentor, 
and she read the manuscript for me and actually handed it to her publisher. So for that first novel, there was no rejection. It was like, I just danced my way to the bank. <laughs> um, and then the second novel followed that one because the two of them were connected. But then I wrote a third one, and that one is down here. That was in 1995. And then I changed what I was doing because artists don't like to get bored. And I couldn't find a publisher. Couldn't, couldn't find a publisher. Couldn't find a publisher. Couldn't, couldn't. 15 years of couldn't find a publisher. And I won't tell you how many rejection letters because you will cry. Um, but I saved them all to remind myself that you don't give up. So how do you do it? You just do. You just do it. I mean, because if you want people to read what you write then you just have to put it out there. Um, and, I don't know, if you want it, I guess I would say if you want it bad enough, you can, you can, you can do it. But it does, it does take courage. It does take a certain amount of courage. And a certain amount of, okay, I just don't care what they think, on to the next publisher, or on to the next, no. I mean, when my manuscript would come back, I would just take out the next address and send it back out. So. When this book was first accepted by the publisher, I hadn't heard from the publisher for, oh, maybe four months. So I emailed, dear so-and-so, I haven't heard from you in four months. I guess that means you don't want the manuscript. So I hereby withdraw it. The next thing I know, the telephone's ringing. I'm talking to somebody in London. No, 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 please, don't, don't withdraw it. We want it. Do you have any more? I was like, yeah. Are they connected? Like, could they be connected? Yes. Great. Okay, we'll send you a contract. Okay. I just made a three book contract after waiting 15 years um, for this to happen. So, you know, and then suddenly I had a three book contract and I just talked to the publisher last week and he's like, you got any more? And I'm like, oh yeah, I have three more for you. So, it just takes time. Yeah. Which one of the characters in this trilogy do you find embodies the most of you? Me. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm seeing some of what the answers to your questions, yeah. I'm seeing some similarities, and I'm just wondering, is there one character that you feel that embodies you the most? Nope. <laughs> uh, no, no. You know, here's the funny thing. I think every any, any author, every author is going to gonna say, well, of course there's some of me in here, because uh, there just is. Um, and the, the closer you know the author, the more those things stick out. So, like, you know, Fitzgerald got in trouble because his friends were like, that's me. No, no it's not you. Yes, it is. And I don't like that portrait. <laughs> um, so the more you know the person, the more the book things stick out to you. Like my sister almost can't read them because she's like, no, no, that's grandma. I was like, no, it's not grandma. <laughs> it's a little piece of grandma, but it's not grandma. I said, but, but she said that. I'm like, yeah, but she didn't say that. No, true. So I really, I mean, I think that Lem's voice is close to mine, you know, and so when I read her, I can hear I can hear myself in her voice, but then again, I gave a reading uh, on Martha's Vineyard for the library there. Um, I had a nice crowd, very nice crowd, and I read from War Pain first because, and the people I was staying with were like, "Well, that's your voice, isn't it?" No, not really. Well, yeah, yes, it's my voice. I wrote it, <laughs> but. No, I mean, they, not, not, none of those characters are me exactly. And Lem certainly isn't me exactly. Um, she's got more um, issues, I hope, than I do. <laughs> um, uh, but but, you're, but you know, you're right. I mean, there are incidents, some of the incidents in both books 
actually happened to me, only in a different context. Okay. Yeah. Stylistically speaking, um, probably from my, uh, stylistically, most definitely from my writing teachers. So my teachers were Ursula K. Le Guin, who wrote uh, a lot, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, my other writing teacher was Michael Cunningham, who wrote The Hours, you know that. So they both had a great deal of influence on me. After that, because I teach the 19th century American literature and I teach early 20th century American literature, probably, and uh, my students wouldn't be surprised, Fitzgerald, yes. I mean, if I could re really write like him, <laughs> I try. I try. Um, and then the, the other authors, I think, who influenced me, not necessarily stylistically, but in terms of content, would be like Willa Cather, um, or actually any writer who writes about strong women characters um, who aren't simply going to get married soon, or have sex soon, or get married and have sex soon. Then. No, you, right, you know, do something else then, or follow a guy around, or such. So, but that they would be my most influences. Yeah. Oh, as someone from Boston, I'm interested in the Martin's Vineyard piece. Mm -hmm. I've mentioned it a couple times, and I was just wondering why Lem ends up there, and what she does there, and also the geographical significance of the places in the book. And mm -hmm. You mentioned California, New York, and Florida, and Martin Jr. And I was wondering if there are any thematic connections in terms of those locations. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I've lived in all of those places. <laughs> so that's sort of my, so we go back to the other question, yeah. But, um, but actually, um, the significance of the geography uh, has to do with, um, uh, how my character understands herself. So her, I mean, she's in California because her father moved there. She doesn't like Santa Monica very much, and she doesn't know it very well. But she discovers that her father retired there because he had this thing for Marilyn Monroe. I think like, like a real thing, like a real crazy thing. And so part of that, part of starting in California had to do with the Monroe um, angle. My character lives in New York because that's where she lives and works. Um, Florida is where her mother died. And then she goes to the vineyard because she has a friend who is a painter from War Paint. So this friend um, knows that she's going through a hard time and you know know, knows the story of what's going on. And so she um, she encourages her to rent a home from a friend of hers to write the book and to sort of clear her mind out. So she goes there not knowing anything about it, just to have a summer, and then it really affects her because she falls in love with the place, and in fact sort of falls in love with the man who owns the house that she rents. But having said that, when I say that, she falls in love with him, but he's gay. So it's not really a roommate, exactly, but they become sort of um, did I answer? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the vineyard for me, I discovered the vineyard in 95 when my cousin invited me to stay there. Even though I had lived in Boston, I had never been out there. And I just, um, I, I love islands. I grew up on an island. And so, um, that too, I wanted to end the story on a place where things end. And Martha's Vineyard, if you know geography at all, or geography, or geology, is actually what they call a terminal moraine. It's where the glaciers stopped moving. And so I wanted to use that terminal moraine for the place that she stops searching, and she finally knows what happened to her mother. So there is some thematic, there's some themes in there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
yes, I say the F word and I'm not afraid of it. Um, I teach uh, feminist theory on and off. Um, I am an affiliate with Women's Studies. And, you know, um, I will, actually my characters in War Paint have a little discussion about feminism. Because the older woman won't have anything of it. And the youngest woman says, yeah, I, I think I am. And the one in the middle is like, no, but um, but uh, but there's my favorite quote about feminism is this one, and I was looking for it because I can't remember who said it, but it goes like this: I don't really know what a feminist is, but I do know that I'm called that whenever <clears throat> I differentiate myself from a doormat. <laughs> so yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I write in the mornings when it's dark and dark. Um, and, or I did for the bulk of my writing life. Recently, not, not so much. <laughs> I'm a little slow in the morning. But I like to write when it's quiet and dark. This is, this is the Sylvia Plath part of me, right? She used to write before the milkman came. And just as an aside, I, I loved Plath when I was a teenager and a, um, and a college student. And so I, I wanted to be Plath. Huh. Yeah. Didn't really think about it. You know, like, except the end part. You know, like, what? You know, like, but because I wanted that, I actually worked for um, Mademoiselle magazine. I mean, I actually followed her path and worked. Luckily, the bell jar did not descend upon me. Um, but so, normally I like to write before the day starts. But do I write anywhere at any time? Yes. I carry a notebook around. If something strikes me, I write it down. If I wake up first thing and there's something in my head or I'm brushing my teeth, I carry it like Mr. Hemingway. I carry a little notebook around because um, unlike the ritual part, the morning, I take inspiration from Harriet Beecher Stowe, who had nine kids, and she still managed to write that big book that changed the country. And she used to write it, like where, changing diapers, making up, you know, wherever she could write, what she did. And I think that's, I think that's a very useful habit form because most of us have to have a job. And if you have to have a job, you can't just say, oh, I'll write when inspiration strikes me. Because you might be in a meeting, or changing diapers, or you have to teach a class, or somebody needs something signed, or something otherly really boring, like the laundry has to be done. And if you can't make little pieces of time to put that book together, it, it will never happen. So. Both, I guess. I'm gonna have a little bit of a little bit of ritual and a little bit of I'm doing this. And I have to say, I like to walk. I've always been a walker, and I write in my head when I'm walking. And then whenever I reach my destination, I write down what I was writing in my head. And that's proved very useful, actually, especially on a campus this big. You know, you're tramping across, uh, you're sweating, uh, and yet there's a little story going on in your head. Oh, that's how it ends. Oh, where's my pen? So, yeah. So you actually hand write it on pen and, pen and paper as opposed to typing it up? No, that that really depends. Now, now, now. See, John was very generous with my age. I was like. Really, only 20, 30 years ago, more like 40. Um, but um, when I started writing at the tender age of five, uh, that was your choice, you know, pen and paper and uh, unpacked Corona typewriter. 
So I wrote my first um, two books that way, and I wrote them longhand first, and then I typed them on a typewriter, which meant you had to keep going back and a little quick tape and uh, and then when you finally get it finished, you run to a Xerox machine and Xerox it because you're like, I'm not doing that again. Um, but, of course, computers made their happy, happy appearance um, while I was in graduate school. And so I bought one in, like, 86. It was kind of big. Um, and then I started doing a kind of mix and match. Like, I'll write something down. And I'll, if it gets far enough along, I switch to typing. But then there are some things I start typing, just because. So it really, it depends. Um, I don't write the whole manuscript out anymore by longhand, no. Um, the last time I did that, I think it was 1992, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, but, I, but hand sometimes gives you a better sense of the story, at least for me. Now, maybe if you, you know, didn't grow up back in the day the way I did, um, it, it wouldn't. But certainly, once the story really gets going, like I really know where I'm going, I really know where it's going to end, I'm on the computer. Because you can erase, you know, you can cut and paste, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I mean, the computer really was like a little miracle. Yeah. I was wondering, did you sing your new three books to your mentor, or is that just something you did in your earlier days of writing? Oh, okay, so I didn't answer that question. Um, yeah. No, I don't send them to my mentors anymore. Um, I'm too old. old. <laughs> I mean, in other words, Ursula is very generous to young writers. And I knew her from the age of about, oh, I think I met her when I was 19. Yeah. And, um, and I, I lived in Portland near her. Till I was about 25, and I would show her everything, you know, because she was in her 50s. She was already famous, um, and she'd been my writing teacher. But once I got the book published, she said to me, "Now you're on your own." <laughs> and so I'm, yeah, you know, I mean, she's very generous. But then you get to a certain point, she's like, "Okay, bye. You sing or swim." So, um, and then. Uh, and by, by the time I met Michael Cunningham, I, I had been long not doing that. I mean, what I do with a manuscript when I finish it is um, uh, sometimes I will ask some friends to read little pieces of it to see if it works or they think it works. But normally I just put it away for a while and then I return to it to see if it works for me. Um, so now I really, you know, I used to have a circle of readers when I was younger, and I think it's very valuable to have a circle of readers who can read that first draft and say to you, Steph, you know, I just don't buy X, or why did you have Y do this, or, you know, because those are good questions. But, you know, this is what now, what, um, this is like my seventh book, I think I can do it now. <laughs> so, but... Like I said, when I was in my 20s, I had a writing group. And, and I, I think they're very important. When you write like a, a full-length novel, will you write it out of order or just from beginning to end over a long period of time? Um, you know, each of the novels is, is a little different. So, um, but, so I try to write it in chronological order. But sometimes I have to go back and rearrange things. So, you know, I'm trying to write the story the way it's unfolding. But then there, there are moments like uh, the one I'm working on now, I realized, because I finished the draft, I was like, there's something missing. I don't know what it is. I don't know. So I just put it away. And then a couple of days ago, actually, I was thinking about it. And I was like, oh, I need another chapter. Here, like right in the middle, because there's a, a family trauma that is important to that story too, but I really haven't fleshed it out. So sometimes I have to go back. Um, 
So, I don't know where I'm going when I start. I know a little bit about what I want the story to do. And then somewhere in the middle, I pray for an ending. Because <laughs> I don't know where it's going. And sometimes it's like, okay, it's done. How does this end? And the, 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 to me, those are the moments, those are the aha moments. Those are the real inspiration moments where you suddenly go, dang, I know where this needs to end. Just because that comes out of nowhere. Um, but it's exciting when it does. Um, and when it when it won't, you're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> will I ever finish this? So, but it really it depends. Um, so, like each one of these books had a different a different trajectory. Though, think about this. I did start all of them at the beginning. because I don't write poetry. I mean, I've tried. I, I, I have tried. And I look and I go, oh, no. That's <laughs> not a poem. Not when I don't want to show anybody that. No, no. So, um, so you know, I, re I really don't know. Um, I think a lot of, what a lot of poets do now is... Um, Use the use online resources, you know, try to get published on, in line online venues, um, and they do they do at least younger poets do a lot of like readings, like poetry slams and stuff like that, just to get heard. Um, but I'll give you the advice that I was given, and I think this would apply to whatever genre you're working in. When I was in college, I asked the same question. How do, you, how do you do this? I mean, how do you get into this world? And my roommate, who was a poet, said, well, I'll tell you what I did, and this is my advice. She's now a professor of English at Bowdoin College, um, 18th century English. I don't know how she went from poet to that, but that's what she does now. But she said to me, oh, Steph, you know, you need to find a living writer that you really admire, somebody who's not dead. Hmm? The one I admire just died. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, start looking again. <laughs> or maybe that poet has students. Um, and because I, I know how that feels too, because uh, one of my favorite authors was Angela Carta. And she, she died at the age of like 54, and I was like, I'll, I'll never meet her now. Yep. Dang it. Really like to meet, oh well. Um, so, Find a living poet, a living writer, who you admire, and then you go study with them. And you ask them, how do I get published? And that's exactly what I did. I took a workshop from Ursula Le Guin. I was the youngest member of that workshop, so it was a little intimidating. Everybody was over 30, and then there was me. Um, and she was a generous, right? And kind of, and really, was good. So, I mean, and, and that's what happened to my friend, to my roommate. She was, when she was at college, she was working with a living poet, I can't remember his name now, but she was working with him in Boston, and that's how she got a couple of her first poems published. Now, she stopped writing poetry, and I asked her, why? And she said it was killing her. I said, what? She said, it's so hard. It was killing me. I had to stop. And I thought that was honest, anyway. But so that, that would be my, you know, and that, that would apply to any, really anything you want to write. If you find someone who does it well and does it the way you would like you to do it, sick them. <laughs> you know, go, go and be with them. And if they're a generous 
person, they will, they, they want students. You know, they want, they want to teach. Ursula loves to teach. Well, she loved to teach. She's 84 now, so I don't think she's been teaching much lately. Um, but, you know. So, that's my best advice, anyway. Yeah. Forgive me, I stepped out for a moment, but. Yeah. So, if someone in this room, say, would like to solicit your opinion, do you have a certain number of people that you take on in order for them to provide you with something that they would like you to read? Is there a process? Um, well, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a hard question to answer because I am a professor of English at the University of Florida, and so my students have access. I mean, they are my students, and if they want to study with me or want me, they come and want to do an independent study with me, there is a process for that. But, you know, mostly, mostly I, I serve this community. Um, I haven't been approached by anyone other than my own students. But that is something that is a thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sure. If someone emailed me, emailed me and said, you know, would you read my work? You know, we'd have to have a conversation about it because I have to grade papers. I have to read dissertation chapters. I have to make sure that my students are served first. But, um, but I, you know, I mean, let's put it this way. Um, I, I wrote to Ursula Le Guin through her publisher and thought, well, I'll never hear from her, you know, I'll get a nice polite postcard back from the publisher. I get a personal letter back from this woman who is famous. Of course, when I got the letter, I nearly fainted. You know, that's that's hand that's hand that's that's from oh my god, that's from her. And she wrote in the letter, um, I am always glad to hear from students. I am teaching this summer in a workshop. Here's how you apply. Here's the address. If you get accepted, I'll be very happy to work with you. So I would just pay that forward right, to anybody who approached me. Um, because that kind of generosity is priceless. And, and I'm, I'd be happy to be that generous. Are you, you know, or, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but are you allowed to do workshops that are beyond the university? No, if I want to just branch out on my own and do workshops, I, I could. And in fact, I'm in negotiations with, um, with a, a writing residency program that I took last year to perhaps teach a workshop next summer or the summer after. Because, in part because um, I don't, in fact, teach creative writing at UF, right? <laughs> I teach literature. So, if I wanted to branch out on my own as an author, as far as I know, there's nothing in my contract that would say I couldn't. Um, and who knows? You never know. Maybe I will. Hold up for money. You don't pay me enough here. But it's coming to your website soon. Huh? I said, but that's coming to your website soon. Oh, yes. That kind of information is coming to my website soon. That's true. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I encourage you. I have brought um, I brought postcards and I brought bookmarks with my website on it. If you'd like to take those away instead of the books, I have, as you see, a limited number of books here that I'm willing to set them selling. Yeah. About the books. Hmm. Oh, if you have a check, I could do that, but I, I, I am not equipped with the card thingy yet. I'm, I'm working on that little card thingy, but I don't have it yet. Can they be read out of order? Absolutely, they can be read out of order. Yeah, I mean, what connects them, in other words, you could read one and be done with it, and that would be that, and you would get a good story. But if you read two, then you go, oh, hmm. So that's why she did this. And then if you read three of them, you're like, oh, I see. So now I've got more of the story. And the next three will be like that in the sense that they're going to be connected to these three, but more connected to each other 
So you could read those, one, two, three, or all six. So. And what, do you know exactly your target audience? I'm not sure if I'm your target audience. But... You know, why, let me ask you a question back. Why do you say that? I don't know, it looks more like it's female than just looking at the cover. I mean, so, so, so let me ask a different question of the audience. So, you know, so, do you only read stories that are about you? Um, because I don't, like, you know, my, my favorite novels is Moby Dick. I'm not a white guy. I have never gone whaling. I didn't live in the 19th century. And I don't kill whales. But I love the novel. So my target audience are people who love to read. Are they about women? Mostly. Are there no men in the book? No. We don't live in a world where there aren't a variety of people. So, so I, I always want I, I'm being a little je you know, jokey because I always find that question interesting because I get asked a lot. And I think, so do readers really pick books out just because they think it's about them? Because I don't. So my top target audience are people who like good stories. something they didn't know. Um, and I think that that would happen in these books, uh, in fact. Yeah. I think for me, um, or an answer to that question might be that when I select something to read, I might read something that resonates with me because there's somebody strong in my life, whether it's male or female, but they show the characteristics of that individual. And for me, these books, I've, I've read a section of a couple of them, and for me, it's about the strongness that we all should have in a particular situation. And I think that the target audience, perhaps maybe even for a young man like yourself, would be that you want to admire strongness, whether it's a male or a female. And these books would perhaps maybe give you that admiration sort of thing. So well, that's that's a better answer than mine. Um, because I, no but I no but I think it, I, I appreciate that because um, they are about people who most of them but people who have to endure. So the character in War Pain who um, who lends my character his house is very, very ill and he hides it from her and from all of his friends because he wants to go it alone. And it's him learning that you can't just go it alone that proves his strength. So I, I think that's a good answer. Yeah. I also think if you're scared to read it or if you have any hesitation, that would be totally good. Because it'll probably come out with something you weren't expecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is why I make people read Moby Dick. <laughs> because they're scared to read it. And but it's true, because I, as a student here, I read Moby Dick, and I was completely terrified out of my mind. I didn't know how I was supposed to relate to a whole bunch of men on a ship going out for a whale. And it was actually one of my favorite books that I've ever read. So, so I say go for it. I like that. It's also because everybody takes something different away from every book. Oh, yes. The intent of the author can be maybe when you wrote it, there was something in you that showed an expectation and or the intention of what you thought you would portray. But then it goes to a whole new level once somebody else reads it. Like, when we pick it, means something different to everyone because we're all different. So. Yeah. No, I think that's true. And also, you know, when you're writing something, your, tar your, your first immediate target audience is you. Because, I, you know, 
Hemingway would, would say this, Fitzgerald would say it, I, I write because I want to read a good, I want to read a good story, I can't find one. So I'm going to write it myself and then hope that other people will, you know, get on board. Um, so I, I, but but it, is, it is a good question because marketers will ask you, your publisher will ask you, what's your target market? Um, and so, you know, you do have to have an answer for that question. Um, but I usually say, people who like to read. Um, 